programs, acting in sequence and without proper accountability, because it always gets things wrong, we can reliably expect that there are going to be more scandals coming. Korea to give up its nuclear ambitions and through Dr. Rice we express appreciation of the progress the United States has accomplished thus far. Now today that relationship uh, is being put to good use to look at the challenges of the 21st century, a century that is being defined by different challenges, but by challenges nonetheless. Challenges of the proliferation of uh, dangerous weapons. Dangerous weapons that could end up uh, in the hands of those most dangerous of people, terrorists, and that in fact are already in the hands of dangerous regimes. nuclear deterrence is so compelling that it would be unwise in the extreme for smaller states not to attempt to become part of the nuclear status quo. And that in part is why the nuclear, uh, the non-proliferation treaty is almost dead in the water because appeals to the idealism of government leaders fall hard on the sword of the impeccable logic of nuclear deterrence. A small country with one nuclear weapon is able to put larger states on notice and in fact in check uh, simply because of the fact that no one knows where that one particular nuclear weapon may be aimed. It just showed how the 
the system was still continuing auto um, of this high alert launch on warning between the United States and Russia. And they're still there now. There's still 2,000 strategic nuclear warheads on high alert, um, ready to go now between the Russians and the Americans. They're stuck in this uh, nuclear deterrence dogma and computerized systems, and it's too difficult to change. And he'd been the first Prime Minister, I think, to address the Conference on Disarmament. He'd gone right across the United States on television speaking about this. He'd had the Oxford Union debate. He had actually gone and promoted our policy, but he had to make it look as though this is just for us and it's not for export. But he was actually exporting it. You know, I always say I think they'll burn in hell no matter what they, for their actions. I mean, they. It doesn't matter if you're part of the military. It doesn't matter if somebody tells you to what you to what you tells you what to do. You're still responsible for what you say and do. And they cold-bloodedly murdered someone, and they could have killed a lot more people. They didn't really care who got hurt, and it wouldn't have been that hard for them to have picked up the phone or even walked down and left a boat a note on the boat saying there's a bomb. Or, nothing. They did nothing. Well, in the mid-1970s, um, there were so many nuclear weapons around um, that could kill people 24 times over at least. Um, and I was a young woman teaching. As I found out more about what had happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we had nuclear warships coming into Auckland Harbour, it was sort of right on the doorstep as I was only a young 23-year-old. And as I discovered really the effects of nuclear weapons, um, I decided I wanted to do something about it. In 1979, I was pregnant with my first child and having three children under three was a pretty strong motivator to get out and do something about parenting. Uh, this is an issue of parenting, uh, what would happen to the planet. I was also working with the Peace Foundation and realising that, um, okay, while you can look at um, the effects of nuclear weapons, what are you doing about what causes conflict and how you solve conflict and the need to work at every level really for peacemaking and so I went into teaching peace studies and things like that so it gave me a background in um, the wider issues, how they're linked and the need to find a way to make the world safer really for everybody. I don't think I was specifically drawn to being anti-nuclear or an environmental campaigner I think I grew up in an environment, and maybe it's just the way I'm built also, around um, kind of more social justice issues. And what's fair and unfair and right and wrong, and that sort of, that sort of approach to how you view things happening in the world. And I think when I left New Zealand I was interested in going and having a, because I left New Zealand and went away for about seven years and, um, and came back with the Warrior in 85. And I was interested in looking at places that were different from New Zealand and trying to understand a little bit about why the world was set up the way it was. So you grew up in New Zealand originally? I grew up in New Zealand and then actually the first time I left New Zealand I left and went to South America when I was about 21. I went and visited some of the uh, Catholic priests that were working in Chile. This was in the um, early 80s, so it wasn't, you know, the whole Pinochet era was um, happening. And, and, and learning about, you know, that things are not, I guess that things are not as some um, as simple as what they originally appear and that New Zealand isn't just a replica of... I knew that before I left, but it's... 
A replica of what? Well, oh, you know, it's just not a repetition of what happens all over the world. I mean, I think I, I got that there was a lot of... I understood that there was a lot of injustice in the world. I didn't actually know where I was going to fit into it or how I was going to be um, involved in changing it or, yeah. Well, I served in the Royal Navy for 20 years, um, from 1962 to 1982. And um, so I came into the Navy at the start of the sort of nuclear era for the Navy, which was when they were about to get uh, the Polaris uh, Ballistic Missile Submarine Force. Um, and I found myself uh, flying in the back seat of carrier-borne nuclear strike jets uh, with a target in Russia, and then um, anti-submarine helicopters with a nuclear depth bomb. Uh, and that was early 70s, really. Um, and I got promoted out of that um, rather young and early. And so I sort of bypassed the ship command route and found myself in the corridors of power, working for an admiral in the Ministry of Defence the time when Mrs Thatcher came to power. So we're talking 1978 to 80. Uh, which was a very interesting time to be around there because Mrs. Thatcher, of course, um, pushed through um, some major uh, nuclear policies, military and civil. And then I finished up in intelligence in um, the command bunker at Northwood on the northwest outskirts of London, um, which was extremely exciting and wonderfully interesting because again, it was a time in the Soviet Empire, if you like, was at its zenith. Um, the Soviet Navy in particular was um, producing new and very um, interesting warships um, almost every other month. Uh, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and there was the beginning of the um, end of the sort of Cold War. You know, I hadn't really faced any of these issues. I actually hadn't even opposed the Vietnam War. I was very non-political. But as I realised what um, these nuclear warships could do that were coming into our harbour, and my first husband was actually the organiser for the Peace Squadron, as, as, we, as I realised how many weapons were on those warships and how far they could um, have impact, really, internationally, um, I realised the importance also of non-violent direct action and at the time it was really scary um, to learn about what a nuclear weapon could do. I mean, it was bad enough knowing what had happened at Hiroshima but then to find out that those weapons were tiny compared with what was being developed by so many states in the mid-70s and of course you had nuclear testing in our region which meant that we were um, learning about the genetic effects also of radiation and as a young mother um, in the early 80s I became really upset about what had happened in Balao and other countries, where Marshall Islands in particular, where nuclear weapons had been used in Tahiti of course and a lot of women giving birth to jellyfish babies and um, deformed children, um, kids with mental um, illnesses as well because of the effects of radiation. I met up with someone and we um, got involved with a, a boat called the Free, which was basically a community at sea. So we joined them and came across to the United States with them and did a couple of projects with them, running medical cargo into Nicaragua um, just after, during the Sandinista and Contra conflict. 
and running soy and other technicians down into places in the Caribbean and that was um that was that's how then we ended up meeting up with um, the Rainbow Warrior and someone who was working on the free moved over to the Rainbow Warrior as a first mate and started telling us about what the Warrior was going to do on this anti-nuclear trip through the Pacific and eventually making its way to New Zealand. Um, and then the, the, of course the extraordinary twist finale was the Falklands War and uh, I actually had applied for redundancy on the back of a defence review which um, Mrs Thatcher's government had introduced to cut the Navy, and then the Navy proceeded to save her political career, uh, but I was still able to leave. Um, but it was a, a most bizarre ending to my time, and I think it did shake me up quite a lot um, in terms of my nuclear thinking. Okay, um, I came into the Navy as an innocent. I came straight from, um, you know, privileged um, schooling. I did not go to university. Um, my university was the Navy. Um, I was wide-eyed, um, enthusiastic, innocent. I enjoyed ships in the sea and the, the camaraderie and the travel and the toys for the boys. And therefore I was a soft touch. I then found myself flying, for goodness sake, which I never actually intended to do when joining the Navy. Uh, but the fleet air arm was losing a lot of um, air crew about the time that I uh, joined and I was press ganged to fly. Um, uh, the jets were very unreliable in those days uh, and particularly it was difficult to get a backseat because they were not such glamorous jobs as navigator rather than pilot. But I found my um, consternation that I actually was quite good at it and uh, I passed out the top of my course and so I was given um, uh, elite you know, squadron Buccaneers, nuclear strike jets, uh, Queen of the Skies, very exciting um, for a while. And uh, I can show you, it's across here there's a, a painting of the sort of life and, um, and it was the ultimate in flying of uh, aircraft carriers. And it was right at the end of the strike carrier phase for the British Navy. Um, couldn't afford them, um, couldn't give up the Americans, although they're trying to do it again now, but I don't think they will. Um, and so it was um, very exciting and fun. And therefore, I, when I was invited to be a nuclear crew, which is of course only a, one of about four crews out of 14 in the squadron, it was an extra privilege. And um, given a special security clearance, uh, very secretive, um, huge indoctrination about us carrying the tradition of the British Navy and of British um, democracy and uh, place in the world on our shoulders, age 25, you know, and it was a great buzz. Well, I think that uh, the importance of the nuclear free policy is simply yeah. that uh, it establishes New Zealand's pacifist intent, and it gives it a uh, you know a, a reputation in terms of disarmament of all weapons of mass destruction is that's disproportionate to its influence in international affairs. It does not have. Uh, you know, any nuclear threat uh, on its horizon. And so, it, in a way, it comes cheaply in the sense that there's no need to have a nuclear deterrent uh, umbrella offered to New Zealand by any of its allies. Uh, but having said that, it still is um, on a 
reputational basis is still a uh, something that gives New Zealand much more clout than it should have in all of the disarming reports. set off by the North Korea situation, but generally and worldwide. And I think uh, in that regard, we, we need to talk to like-minded states. We know um, New Zealand in particular has a, uh, how to put it, rather anti-nuclear bent. And uh, we certainly uh, think that uh, we can talk to um, New Zealand about uh, seeing what we can do together in terms of uh, strengthening the non-proliferation. So New Zealand's anti-nuclear stance has its advantages. I was making a <laughs> ironic comment. I hope that's not an elusive concept for you and your viewers. No, uh, I think uh, New Zealand, uh, uh, not because of the ironic comment, but rather generally uh, shares the view about uh, non-proliferation. New Zealand has always been a vigorous proponent of the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And so I think uh, in it is an example of the fact that the U.S. and New Zealand have a lot of common common ground. He indicated this morning that New Zealand may have a significant role in the North Korean issue. Did he identify that, and what was the substance of it? He did? Well, when you set up a sort of counter-proliferation regime, everybody's got to play their part in that, and New Zealand's been part of the. Uh, proliferation security initiative which has been looking at various ways in which you stop uh, uh, materials for weapons of mass destruction crossing borders for example crossing high seas crossing uh, so yeah for sure I mean we've got a role to play in the general network of, of stopping transport of materials he thought that it would be um uh, given our anti nuclear stance, who might be particularly useful? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no one can question our credentials, put it that way. Was the nuclear still You know, I never that? raise it. I only It's only raised with me by New Zealand journalists <laughs> who want me to repeat things, but uh, uh, I feel that we can, uh, we can work very closely with New Zealand on issues of common interest, and I think we have many of those. that, uh, again, there was no, no possibility of, of a nuclear exchange, much less that New Zealand would be threatened uh, uh, by nuclear weapons in any way, shape, or form. You are right in that the, the emphasis now has moved from mutual assured destruction to flexible response. Flexible response puts a premium on tactical nuclear weapons as opposed to strategic nuclear weapons. It doesn't doesn't make a lot of military sense to engage in large-scale wars of annihilation when you can use specially configured tactical nuclear weapons to achieve what formerly uh, uh, used to used to be done by conventional means. And in that sense. The geostrategic environment in the South Pacific uh, has been altered somewhat uh, simply because the South Pacific is increasingly being viewed as a, a resource-rich uh, uh, area of opportunity by rising powers, the Chinese in particular. And whereas in the past, the United States 
may have worried about Soviet nuclear-powered ships transiting the South Pacific, now the United States worries about Chinese nuclear submarines uh, transiting the South Pacific. So we're about to see a, a renewal of a rivalry in, in the western fringe of the Pacific, but the new rival will be China as opposed to the Soviet Union. And then the same considerations will have to come in play with regards to New Zealand's anti-nuclear stance because the Japanese, excuse me, the Chinese uh, will neither confirm or deny the presence of tactical nuclear weapons on their surface ships. And uh, New Zealand, unless it improves its anti-submarine warfare capability, will probably never be aware of the presence of Chinese nuclear submarines within its territorial waters. But certainly the relationship between New Zealand and its traditional security partners has changed quite dramatically uh, based upon the realization that New Zealand is not quite as white or European as many of these traditional partners may have thought it was. And to be honest with you, that to me is a good thing. Um, how would you argue against those who subscribe to the nuclear deterrent strategy, whether it be geostrategic or routine or center type of strategies like I mentioned earlier on? Um, how, how have you taken the argument back to those who are persuasive in uh, advocacy for deterrence? Well, I learned a lot from listening to David Longy's arguments on these and the, um, of this issue in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. And I agree with him that actually I don't think nuclear deterrence works and at the time the argument for us was that we would declare our homes nuclear free, our cities nuclear free etc because we didn't want a bomb, nuclear bomb used against other people or have them targeted at us. It was a very simple argument. Now since then of course I've, I've gone into a lot more research about it but I actually don't think you can prove that nuclear deterrence works. and. Um, the fact that we haven't had um, a nuclear war or bombs used again since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, except in testing, um, I think is partly divine intervention <laughs> and also um, the fact that um, there are laws developing to do with not using them again and also that there were a lot of other factors like you don't know whether mediation stops something happening or um, people's movements change things. You can't prove these things. So you, do you feel that the strength of diplomacy has been more successful? I don't think you can prove any of it. This is the problem. Um, subjective. Well, it is. Uh, but I think also the, the norm that has developed um, about not using them since Hiroshima and Nagasaki is also linked with the strengthening of legal arguments against use and threat. And of course that's why we took this case to the World Court to try and test that and it came from Christchurch, it came from a, a local magistrate that I worked very closely with over a good 10 years for that to happen. Is that, that indoctrination, do you think it was necessary to make sure you had a psychological disposition that would actually deploy should you begin a new Oh yes, um, it, it was very um, focused. Um, but it was the first time I'd ever be in expo exposed to, you know, the political dimension of my work, and I had just not thought politically at all. Um, I was a natural conservative. Um, I was not political in terms of um, any rebellious thoughts about, you know, policy or anything like that. I just accepted what my leaders told me, with a sense of awe and wonder, you know, that I was actually doing what I was. 
um, and it was enough to master the, you know, the drills. But then I got my target, which was um, a military airfield outside Leningrad, um, which now is St. Petersburg's um, civil airport. Uh, and I had a shock when I landed there in 1999 uh, to attend a security conference and discover that it had been my target. Uh, but I, had, I did have misgivings uh, when I was planning to strike that target. And my pilot and I uh, both realized it was the extreme end of our range. We had no spare fuel for avoiding defenses. We had to fly straight over a neutral, neutral country, Sweden, because we were going to launch in the Norwegian Sea. We were trying to keep up with the Americans then. Uh, and the Buccaneer was on the absolute stops in terms of its range to get a target in Russia. Um, and then we had a 10 kiloton freefall bomb, um, which we uh, were going to have to do toss at the target and then escape low level, but uh, we discovered we probably wouldn't have enough fuel to get back. And we had to think about that and say, do we want another target? And then we realized that they wouldn't give us another one. They told us just to get on with it. Um, and that probably there would be nothing to come back for if we ever had to do it. Uh, we were set near echelon, follow-up, tactical, strike. Um, and that we would have therefore got into World War Three Holocaust by then, and uh, Britain would have been attacked, um, and would be a radioactive wasteland by then. Declaring yourself nuclear-free is one really strong expression. Or well, one, re I think it's really quite a strong way of saying, we will, it's not just saying we won't have nuclear weapons in our country. It's saying we do not believe that nuclear weapons are part of the security um, framework for this planet. We won't be part of that. We actually don't think that's the right way to go. We don't think they're going to make this, this um, the, whole, the whole planet any more safe or any more secure. So the deterrent on that is Yeah, they just said no, we don't think that's that's, so it was, it's much bigger than just saying, no, we don't want to have nuclear weapons ourselves. It's saying, we don't think that's the right framework for um, enabling security on the planet. It's, it's a hard, it's a hard case to make in this region, where there's been an awful lot of, um, suffering by people already from nuclear weapons and they weren't even supposedly the enemy. Even if it does cause the annihilation of the smaller nuclear state, the very fact that it has such a weapon will be a deterrent to hostilities from, from larger states. And that's very clearly evident in uh, the strategic reasoning of Iran. And he'd been the first Prime Minister, I think, to address the conference on disarmament. He'd gone right across the United States on television speaking about this. He'd had the Oxford Union debate. He had actually gone and promoted our policy, but he had to make it look as though this is just for us and it's not for export. But he was actually exporting it. 
And I, I think he probably had to say something like that. I mean, you wouldn't go out there and say, hey, we're trying to change the world with our nuclear-free policy. But that's, I think, he, he well understood, as everyone did, that a little country in the South Pacific who had had that sort of thing happen to them from one of the nuclear powers. I mean, can't, you kind of get to where it's a little hard to argue. And um, it certainly did get exported. You know, I, I think it's been a really, I think it's been relatively significant in terms of just challenging that whole global security issue. Oh yes, it's certainly making us a lot safer. Look, they're now coming into our backyard and we're on their side and they're blowing up boats and killing people. Yes. <laughs>
charge, if you will, on nuclear free zones, uh, and again, the non-proliferation regimes in general, there I do think that New Zealand serves as a model for other states, and uh, in fact, there are several other small states that have emulated New Zealand's approach, not with the formality of the 1987 Act, but who de facto have entry uh, to nuclear powered uh, and nuclear armed uh, military vessels in their territorial waters. I am thinking of Uruguay, for example, another small state that has quietly emulated the position. And here's another interesting rub. New Zealand's commitment to non-proliferation may have served as a model for the Brazilian-Argentine bilateral treaty that basically committed them to eliminating their nuclear weapons development programs, programs that were uh, very well advanced under the military dictatorships of the 1970s and 80s, and which were dismantled completely by bilateral treaty in the late 1980s and early 90s after the restoration of democracy, uh, in part, I would argue, using New Zealand's commitment um, as the model for such. Both of those countries do retain uh, civilian nuclear energy programs for, for power, uh, but uh, they're the only case in, in history where countries have voluntarily dismantled advanced nuclear weapons production facilities uh, in the interest of promoting uh, global disarmament. And of course other countries have followed suit and taken on this issue. Um, there may not be a lot of them in terms of single states doing it, but Austria has and Mongolia, and there were certainly moves to get um, the Philippines, Japan, Australia, all around that time, Denmark, of course. Um, but, if, but you look at the development of nuclear-free zones, which is linked with this, and with what happened in Antarctica and Latin America, nuclear-free zones, then you get what has happened throughout the whole of the Southern Hemisphere. And these are ideas that came out of our country that were supported by citizen groups, collecting signatures for petitions and others, and getting Kirk involved as a Prime Minister on these issues, and for him advocating a South Pacific nuclear free zone, it might have taken another 10, 12 years for that to happen. But now we have effectively a Southern Hemisphere nuclear free zone, and zones that are developing, not least in places like um, Central Asia, but also there's talk of 
the Arctic becoming nuclear free like the Antarctic and really even in Central Europe um, and Southeast Asia and of course um, in the Northeast Asia now with the change of the Japanese government. So the debate has not gone away. The Japanese, uh, the new regime in Japan is also looking at the possibility of following New Zealand's example and either coming out from under the nuclear umbrella or at least moving to a non-first use um, uh, policy at this point. But they're definitely promoting a Northeast Asian nuclear free zone. And what, what was your understanding of the scenario or situation that may develop that would necessitate that type of action to be taken? Oh, um, you know, some form of security crisis um, in NATO versus uh, Soviet Union, um, in which the assumption was that the Soviet Union were on the march and that they would have therefore um, invaded with huge um, superior conventional tank army across the East German plain um, and that we couldn't hold the, um, uh, the, the offensive and so uh, we were going to rely on first use of tactical nuclear weapons to try and stop it, uh, but that would of course involve escalation and uh, it would be uncontrollable probably if we were part of the single integrated operational plan in order to try to um, stop that uh, through sort of shock and awe, you know, and we would uh, play our bit, our part in this. And that was the role of, uh, of the nuclear um, strike force um, within the Navy and the Air Force. So we then moved back to enter submarine um, and that's a whole different ballgame. And that's where I actually began to think about my work because um, when I finished with Buccaneers I hoped to go back to general service. But instead they said, oh no you don't, uh, you've got this elite experience and we want you now to go and uh, put a bit of um, backbone and um, elan into the anti-submarine helicopter squadrons. However, the nuclear submarines in those days, the Soviet ones, were very fast, they could go very deep, and the, t the torpedoes that we had were just not fast enough, they could be outrun by um, Soviet submarines. And so they gave us this death bomb, and that was really scary. Because it, it was a nuclear depth charge, um, and I had to brief this team of observers I had, they're called observers in the fleet they're on, um, and um, the drill was that we were required to drop this thing, uh, and it was, I think, uh, there was a low or high yield switch on it, and the low yield was about half a kiloton, and the high yield was 10. It was nearly as large as the Hiroshima bomb. And um, so it was a suicide mission, because you couldn't get away in a helicopter quick enough for it would go off. And I started asking questions. I said, I've got to brief this. And of course, because I'd come from a nuclear strike uh, background, um, my predecessors had just accepted it without question. And I started asking questions. And I was taken aside. I was, they were really worried about me because I was potentially subversive. But I was asking common sense questions. It was militarily incompetent. Uh, were they going to be used as, again, as tactical nuclear weapons? And that has never been tried in the field. There's never been a tactical nuclear weapons test. Uh, it's all been compu computer simulation. And so the scientists involved are pushing for real live testing. And I think that opens a can of worms. I think that uh, the more they're uncertain about the, the, the real-time uh, effects of uh, a nuclear, a tactical nuclear detonation, the less likely military commanders will be uh, prone to use them. The more certainty they have in terms of the scope of the detonation, then the more likely, particularly under certain political conditions, that uh, national security leaders will decide to use a tactical nuke rather than adhere to uh, conventional warfare. I, I think it was very much um, a question of um, focusing my mind uh, on the reality of what I was required to do 
discovering uh, what this bomb was capable of and understanding the differences in the previous delivery, which was what was called a, a long toss maneuver, um, where you could actually come in at low level and high speed in the Buccaneer, and then you would climb, and in the climb you'd release the bomb. And it would go about five miles on a trajectory, and meanwhile you turned away hard and never came up high, and then you'd go away low, low level, high speed, so you were at least five miles, six miles away, and very low, and heading away uh, from the detonation. Um, whereas in a helicopter, you would be a little more than a mile away by the time it went off. I moved over to the warrior. It was kind of double-edged. One was, I like what they were doing, and they were also heading in the direction of home. So I, I, I didn't really know anything about Greenpeace then. I just liked what this boat was going to do, so I moved over to them. The, the warrior was then kind of rotting away, if you like, sitting up a creek in Jacksonville in Florida. And we were sitting up another creek on free um, in Florida as well. And um, this friend was telling us about what they were going to do. And so um, myself and my partner, he was an engineer, was working as an engineer on the free. Um, we wrote away to Greenpeace saying we wanted to join and these are the reasons why it took forever to get an answer back but eventually they said oh yeah okay you can be a crew so we switched boats yeah and then we sailed out from there through the Panama Canal out to Hawaii and out to the Marshall Islands in the North Pacific. Yes uh, one of the first books that we helped publish was Pacific Women Speak and later we did one called Pacific Women Speak Out for denuclearization um, and independence in the Pacific area really and we have the stories of women who gave birth to these babies that look like um, bunches of purple grapes or like a bit of jelly with a few hairs on it and um, little heart beating and all the rest and then they die um, and these were kids that were re really born as a result of radiation effects and I've spoken with Hibakusha, that's survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, some of the older women who've been prepared to speak to me through a second generation woman as well. And they've talked about the same thing, that they gave birth to these things that looked like bunches of purple grapes or apples or funny animals and they weren't looking like babies at all. So when we took a case to the World Court later in 1995, um, in fact, when um, there were court hearings on it. We made sure that one of those women, Lijon Eknalene, came from the Marshall Islands and spoke to the World Court judges about these jellyfish babies. Are we still seeing incidents of deformed babies being born as a consequence of nuclear testing in the Pacific region? Yes, yes, it's an ongoing intergenerational thing. And the tragedy is that the UN Scientific Committee on Effects of Atomic Radiation, which is based in the UN, bases its data and what happened at, on what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But of course they didn't go and interview the women at the time and it was a no-no for many of those women also to, to speak about the issues that were happening to them. It was very private for them. But also um, there was no the data wasn't being collected. Uh, and so the results are actually quite skewed on that. But of course when the US tested and when they tested at Bikini um, the um, Americans paid compensation to the uh, Marshallese for kids that were born deformed, who had mental illness, um, you know, might have been born with club feet or whatever. And so it was an acknowledgement that it did cause those effects, um, but of course they would never give compensation to the Japanese and there was huge discrimination against the women in particular who couldn't even, some, some of them, many of them, still can't tell their grandchildren that they are survivors. Yeah, when I was learning about, you know, the whole nuclear issue 
in the process of being involved with it and learning that the Pacific actually had a really long history of not, not just the anti-nuclear movement, although that's in part the reason why it existed, but had a very long history of nuclear weapons either development or being used in its backyard for a very long time, whether you're talking about Christmas Island and the British or um, the Americans and the Marshall Islands or the French and um, French Polynesia. So you, it began, I began to understand a lot better about where the whole anti-nuclear movement in the region had come from. And it, the more you learn about it, the, the history at least of the whole nuclear weapons development and use of them, uh, for me anyway, the more um, it made sense that you would be trying to stop further development of it. Now I met a young woman only about eight years ago in Nagasaki who came up to she was 23. She had a photo of her baby with deformed hand, like fingers like this and unusual bits. And she said that this, she was third generation, so her baby was actually fourth generation. And the doctor had warned her that he that she might have um, deformities. Well, her husband divorced her immediately. That baby was born because of what had happened to his, how he was born with his hand. And she begged me to go to everyone I could in the UN and other places to tell the story of that little boy. Uh, and I've done that. Um, because I think it has been covered up hugely and I've actually published on that as well um, because I think those stories need to get out. From a compensation point of view, does the United States kind of differentiate between um, Nagasaki or Hiroshima um, being in a conflict kind of environment um, compared to the testing regimes? I would say so and that's, I actually met one of the old doctors who had gone, been at the Marshall Islands and helped with compensation for the Bikini people um, but it also tried to get it for the people of Kochi City, which is where the, um, I think the boats had gone out, the Japanese fishing boats had been under the testing, and so they'd, in fact many of the men had stopped developing semen for eight years for example, but they didn't look at what was happening to women who stopped menstruating as well. But then they didn't do the follow-on um, of what had happened to the Japanese after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and you're right, it is linked with, I'm sure, um, an act in time of war as opposed to testing in a contained space. It strikes me that the Americans uh, did not have a full understanding of what New Zealand was in the 1980s. I don't think that the American government at the time, the Ronald Reagan administration, fully, fully understood the impact of uh, the protests against the nuclear tests in the 1970s did not fully understand the Polynesian orientation of New Zealand and the impact of things such as the, uh, the protests during the Springbok tour, uh, etc. And I say that because the United States, when dealing with the New Zealand government, more than likely spoke to a largely Pakia male diplomatic corps and political elite and believe that this elite uh, was sincere in its traditional post-colonial commitments to the interests of its, uh, its Cold War security patrons, the United States and the United Kingdom, and did not realize that the ground was shifting underneath that New Zealand political and diplomatic elite uh, and in fact, they would begin to respond to the domestic pressures for a significant change in orientation above and beyond these traditional alliance commitments. And so the United States was taken by surprise 
when New Zealand declared its non-nuclear status, and we well know that its response was really quite hostile. And now, in the 1990s, New Zealand has advanced either further into its Polynesian identification, an identification that now comes across in the composition of its diplomatic and political elite. And there's been a generation or so of North American diplomats, uh, as well as the public at large, that have come to see New Zealand in this recast light. That is, New Zealand not as a firm member of the European dominant security alliance structure, but New Zealand as an independent Pacific Island state. And I think in that measure, the expectations of New Zealand's adherence to the security concerns of the United States and the UK are much less today than they are, uh, than they were in the mid 1980s. Oh, on, a, on a personal le level, there was quite a strong connection between all of us on the boat because we spent such a long time on the boat together. And then there was the, um, the moving of the Rongelap people <coughs> in the Marshall Islands where they had been irradiated by one of the US tests in the 1950s because the US had done a lot of their nuclear testing both, both underground and atmospheric in the Marshall Islands. They were given, given the Marshall Islands as a trust territory after the Second World War and they completely abused that trust by developing and testing nuclear weapons out there. And in the case of the Rongelap community, they had, they had um, been exposed to quite uh, heavy radiation from one of the, from fallout from one of the tests and the US um, guys who were running the test at the time did it knowing full well that that exposure would happen on the downwind islands and that didn't come out for a number of years but they just got bored with waiting for the wind to change really which is like a terribly tragic criminal thing to do but that's what they did. Well, you, you don't see a lot in terms of the environment. I mean, radiation is, unless it's pretty much, you can't see the plutonium in the ground or whatever the radioactive materials are that are still in the ground. What we saw was a community that was, had lived on this island for generations, that was willing to uproot itself and take apart its entire, um, all its buildings and basically wrap everything up and move to another island that they didn't own, that was barely able to support them, all because 
more than 20 years after their exposure, they still felt they were in danger by staying in their own island. They still felt like they, the, the number of um, miscarriages and strange births that they had experienced and the, the fact that a number of, well, almost the entire population that was below the age of 10 at the time had had their thyroids removed and were on thyroid medicine. You know, they had a whole lot of, a whole string of um, physical or health related problems. And then they just had a lot of um, kind of psychological angst about whether they could trust anyone that was telling them that it was okay to stay there, it was okay to eat the food, it was okay to continue having babies. Um, just a, a huge amount of uncertainty. But at the same time, they also had an incredible amount of forgiveness. I mean, nobody was walking around going, oh, those bastard Americans, you know, I, I could just kill them for what they did to us. They were extraordinarily forgiving and not vengeful in any way, which I, I thought was a huge lesson, to be honest. On mile-long Johnston Island's limited acreage, crowded around and between the runway and ramp areas were the missile launch complex and a line of more than 30 instrument rocket launchers together with the many other necessary testing and support facilities. The launch vehicle groomed to carry the nuclear warheads to test detonation altitudes was the Thor missile. In the early plans it was scheduled to do the job for two and possibly three nighttime bursts at various altitudes above the Earth's atmosphere. The Pacific Missile Range ship moored at Johnston tracked the missile in flight for range safety purposes. But Johnston Island itself was only the hub of an extensive network of land, ship, and aircraft instrument stations radiating in all directions deep into both northern and southern hemispheres of the Pacific. July, the third nuclear launch, another try for the very high altitude starfish event, was flawless, including the performance of the many auxiliary instrumentation rockets sent into selected trajectories about the burst region. Starfish detonated at its planned strength and height, producing wide upper atmosphere glow and extensive auroral effects. You know, I think what's happening with the Tahitian workers or the French military that were at Monodora were how over the years. <clears throat> when they had their testing program there, it feels like, you know, history is repeating itself. That's what the Marshall Islanders had to go through. Long, long years of fighting and discussing and people having very unhappy and painful health problems towards getting some sort of recognition that, yes, they were affected by what went on there. And that seems, you know, you know, if there's one thing that we don't do, it's we don't really learn from our history very well. And now we have another place in the middle of the South Pacific that's like a huge radiated nuclear waste dump sitting out there in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You know, which is, it will take years to, both in terms of it's the people that were affected by it, to get any sort of resolution out of it, I think. Yeah. solidaire, qui entend vivre en paix avec tous, peut éclairer la marche de l'humanité. À cette fin, elle doit d'abord compter sur elle-même. J'en appelle ici à tous ceux qui ont choisi de servir l'État. Je compte sur le concours de leur intelligence, de leur expérience et de leur dévouement. À toutes les Françaises et à tous les Français, au-delà de cette salle et de ce palais, je dis ayons... And from there we came down to New Zealand, yeah, we arrived here on July 7th. French blows up on July 10th. 
Well, we arrived on the 7th of July. It was a very cold, overcast day, I remember. And, you know, quite a few boats had come out to meet us. And um, we came into Marsden Wharf and the, the whole harbour area has changed dramatically since then. Um, I, I had a lot of my family on the docks. I hadn't seen a lot of my family for a long time. So that was quite, quite a different sort of arrival for me than it was for any of the other crew because I was the only one that was from New Zealand. Um, and then it was quite, it was quite hectic because um, we were going to be here for two weeks and then we were leaving with a whole, a whole flotilla of boats to go to Mororoa, a whole flotilla of sailing boats from New Zealand. So there were lots of meetings with um, skippers and the crew and with the local New Zealand office and it was quite a whirl of activity. Plus there was you know, a number of people on the crew who were trying to have a few days off like while they were in New Zealand before we went to sea again because we'd been at sea for quite a long time. Um, so, you know, there was a couple of extra hands that were brought in to take over with the cooking so the cook could have a, uh, a bit of time off and things like that. But and, and there was a lot of work to do on the boat as well. And when it happened? Well, it was, you know, sh the, well, the major thing was that somebody died for us, somebody that we knew who was part of us, one of us who died as a result of that. That was. You know, it was quite hard to deal with all the, the um, ongoing uh, kind of spy thriller and impact on the organisation, impact on New Zealand at the same time as sort of losing a friend. 20 years ago, the Greenpeace flagship Rainbow Warrior was blown up and sunk in Auckland Harbour, New Zealand. The ship was wrecked beyond repair. The end, there was three engineers on the boat and all of them, you know, in a matter of, you know, half an hour of talking to each other knew that it had nothing to do with anything on the boat. It couldn't have been something that came from inside the boat and it was quite quickly established by the police divers that the explosion came from outside the boat because of course all the boat, the metal on the side of the boat was inwards, not outwards, so the explosion came from the outside. Is there a feeling that, you know, of concern or caution relating to the French? No, 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 in terms of anything like this, no, that no, happened. Absolutely respected. nothing. No, not in your wildest dreams. Honestly, if somebody had said that, you would have told them they were paranoid and, yeah, oh, no, not, not in your wildest, none of us thought about that. I mean, I think we anticipated we might have some, um, we might run up against a bit of grief once we got to Muriroa, because by that stage, you know, quite a number of things had happened to people who had gone to Mororoa. Quite, and they weren't known for their gentle ways. Um, so, but no, not not nobody was thinking about that. You know, it's a fabulously um, interesting and funny in lots of ways um, story of how the New Zealand police, you know, doggedly. Um, tracked down to in New Zealand too, you know, it was a typical case of kind of nosy park in New Zealand in the middle of winter in this little boat hired out of New Caledonia that brought the explosives and kind of bumbled into the Whangarei harbour and then proceeded to be very loud and um, in a small place, well, a relatively small place in the middle of winter and you've got French sailors talking loudly and fraternising with the local hairdressers and all the rest of it. You know, the fact that the in Okahu Bay, the the sailing boats there had been broken into recently, so the Okahu Bay Sailing Club or Yachting Club had decided to put a night watchman on, who was, you know, you know, sitting there with his binoculars watching the the hire van arrive and put the inflatable in the water with the um, divers and then trot off to put the explosives on the side of the warrior. This is all in retrospect, but they could piece it all together. And they did manage to catch two of those involved. And through a long course of events, they were 
New Zealand negotiated with the United, what well, had the UN as the, the kind of facilitator between France and New Zealand to get agreement that these two people would be transferred to Hau Atoll, which was the French military base in French Polynesia where they'd serve out their time for manslaughter. And, um, but of course, they, the French completely thumbed their nose at the UN and at New Zealand and at Fernando's family. And I think they stayed there for like a year before they were taken back to France and treated like heroes. And, you know, just disgusting in terms of any kind of sense of justice or, you know, I always say I think they'll burn in hell no matter what they, for their actions. I mean, they, it doesn't matter if you're part of the military, it doesn't matter if somebody tells you to, what you, to, what you tells you what to do, you're still responsible for what you say and do. And they cold-bloodedly murdered someone and they could have killed a lot more people, they didn't really care who got hurt. And it wouldn't have been that hard for them to have picked up the phone or even walked down and left a, boat, a note on the boat saying there's a bomb or nothing. They did nothing. So I, I really have no sympathy for people who are cowards like that. Does that feeling um, extend to those who gave the orders further up the chain as well? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Right, right to the top of the French government. To meter wrong, yeah. Yeah, and there's just this kind of mishmash of, I mean, I'm sure everyone who was involved knows they were involved and whether they were given orders to neutralise or to go out there and put a bomb on the side of the boat and blow those people to smithereens, doesn't matter. Everyone knew what they were doing, so they're all responsible. It shows you just how stupid military people can be. One destructive killing act against an unarmed defence ship killed a member of its crew and sealed in place the very policy they were fighting so hard to overcome. What, what effect do you think that had on the nuclear free movement here in New Zealand? Oh, huge. I think it was huge. Um, because, it, you know, it happened. It seems so... Um, inept of the French really, on a number of different levels. And not of the French, but of the French government. If their plan was to continue sort of operating in the South Pacific and being able to run their nuclear testing program there, they would have been well aware of the um, anti-nuclear sentiment in the region, not just in New Zealand. So, I, I, I think the impact of them being caught blowing up an anti -nuke, peaceful anti-nuclear boat, or the boat of a peaceful anti-nuclear movement, um, it was huge because one, it, it, it was something then that didn't just happen to Greenpeace, it happened to New Zealand too, and by extension it happened to this region. Here was this colonial power, because that's the way France is seen in this part of the world, um, coming into the South Pacific again, treating New Zealand like it's just another little island nation that isn't really got its shit together and they don't need to really do any of their homework they can just go in there and do what they like and go home again and you know job done well it wasn't like that you know New Zealanders were really upset they were upset at a so-called ally from the second world war <laughs> came in and just did something like that in our harbour and to people that were, I mean New Zealand has quite a long history of civil disobedience or protest, you know non-violent protest, well we've got some history of violent protest too but you know it's not, we're not, we don't necessarily consider protest as a bad thing, we don't like them to do generally, we don't like them to get violent but we, people didn't like that and by extension they didn't like what France was trying to do, which was test nuclear weapons in the South Pacific. Well they were testing nuclear weapons in the South Pacific. So I think it, it may, it just for a lot of people I think who may have been sitting on the fence, I think they firmly got offered onto the right side and decided if this is what nuclear weapons is all about then I'm not for it. 
this is I mean I think for Greenpeace and for those of us who are involved in it um, it just confirmed why nuclear weapons have no place on this planet I think it's um it, it really helped I think garner an enormous amount of support for New Zealand going nuclear free um, how significant was New Zealand's nuclear free legislation for you, your city, for New Zealand and for the world from a global security point of view? That's a small question. <laughs> <laughs> I think our anti-nuclear policy has been extremely significant. Uh, for me personally, I think it's been something I've been incredibly proud of, having been part of um, the public education that went around that to develop it. Um, I think we've been way out in front in, in terms of legal arguments um, about use and threat of nuclear weapons and challenging nuclear deterrence. For our city, we were the first nuclear-free city um, in Christchurch in 1982. Um, it's been important for our city, we've honoured that and we've become a peace city since on the 20th anniversary of that. Um, nationally, I think it's given us a sense of pride um, in an issue that we stood up to the big boys about, but also within the UN we are seen as a country that has moral leadership on this issue and has been prepared to stand out. We're seen really as a middle power within the UN and I don't think we would have been on the Security Council um, in the late 1990s um, if it hadn't been for our anti-nuclear policy. I think I think New Zealand was still pretty brave because, you know, we got pretty much isolated by everyone, including Australia. Um, you know, we were not supposed to be pursuing these this nuclear power. We were not supposed to be saying no to other nuclear powers who wanted to, you know, extend their domain. Um, we were being a little upstart, unruly, who did we think we were, having a mind of our own on our foreign policy. So I think it was quite a brave thing that New Zealand did, and I think it's given us a particular kind of reputation in the world beyond nuclear issues. And so those sort of experiences I've been through have helped me really um, maintain uh, that it is important, one, that we encourage our young people to be involved in this and, and, and trained up in a way of being able to have dialogue with decision makers. And two, to own really that, that sense of passion and moral high ground, if you like, um, that we did in the UN and other places, because I've seen it have an impact.
has a right to peaceful nuclear power that meets the energy needs of its people. But the size and configuration of this facility is inconsistent with a peaceful program. Iran is breaking rules that all nations must follow, endangering the global nonproliferation regime, denying its own people access to the opportunity they deserve, and threatening the stability and security of the region and the world. America, the United Kingdom, and France are at one. Iran's nuclear program is the most urgent proliferation challenge that the world faces today. Confronted by the serial deception of many years, the international community has no choice today but to draw a line in the sand. On October the 1st, Iran must now engage with the international community and join the international community as a partner. If it does not do so, it will be further isolated. The unit, not only do we have to put forward a credible scientific case. New Zealand being Well, we haven't discussed this today. New Zealand is working with a group of other small like-minded countries who are represented on the nuclear suppliers group. Obviously, the agreement that has been reached to raise the number of concerns for New Zealand as a, a nuclear-free country, and those concerns have been shared by uh, others, uh, small Western democracies. So we'll be meeting, we'll listen to the case, we're networking with others. Uh, it would be no secret that we would like to see more conditionalities around the agreement. Uh, we're pursuing this diplomatic. nuclear weapons, there's a recognition now that they can do far more harm than they could ever do good. Um, there's obviously a reluctance from those that had them to necessarily reduce uh, their, their holdings of nuclear weapons because they, they see them somewhat as a deterrent. Um, I think it's different when it comes to nuclear power. Um, in that case, you know, there's actually and growing support actually for nuclear power and you've seen that out of Africa and other countries as they move towards a, uh, a sort of greener uh, energy uh, environment. Come to terms with it. We can't grasp that we are the minuscule minority. 
Because Falwell discovered 